Hello and welcome back to Object Oriented Programming with Python Part 20. This has been so much fun, we're just going to keep on going and uh, we're even going to add a walrus here. So let's jump right in. We've covered a lot of Python, covered a lot of its syntax and a lot of its vocabulary words. So now we're going to jump into some more advanced stuff, okay? There are usually, or I should say there is usually more than one way to accomplish the same thing. And here is a perfect example. Suppose that you want to limit a number to be between 0 and 100. Well, you could use this. If x is greater than 100, result is 100. If it's less than 0, result is 0. Another way is just to say result equals the max of, the min of, 100, x, and 0. If you study that and look at it real quick, you could see that the result will always be between 0 and 100. This is just a simple, simple um, example, but you can do a lot of shortcuts. So let's start with some other ones. You have the asterisk operator. Now it is the multiplication operator, but we also expand on it. Say that you need to fill a list of whatever, uh, list and you just want to fill it with zeros. Well, you could use a for loop like the one you, you see there for i n range n x dot append zero and it'll just go over and over and over until it fills it all with zero because that loop will go n times. Or you could do an implied loop with the asterisk operator as you see on this example. x equals the element 0 in a set multiplied n times. Now this works with strings, which is another type of list. So if you said x equals and a string blah times 80, well you would have blah 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 80 times. So you can expand any list with the asterisk operator and it's very useful. Let's suppose that you need to know if some variable b is between a and c. Well, you could do what you see there in the first little box. If a is less than b and b is greater than c, blah, blah, blah. But in Python, because comparisons are done left to right, and they will keep going until something fails, then you could do if a is less than b, less than c which is easier to read and more along the lines of what you would see in math class. Methods are called or executed using the parentheses. So my method, parentheses x, will run a method called my method and it'll use x as a parameter. If the method does not need any parameters, then you still have to put the parentheses to execute it. If you do not put the parentheses, then my method is the name of it, is the name of your subroutine, your function, your method. And so using that refers to the actual method. So f equals my method places a reference or a link, if you want to call it that way, like an address to my method in a new variable called f. Well, now, if you called f parentheses x, it would run the same code as my method because both f and my method point to the same place, the same lines of memory. So, that's nice because that means that you could pass methods as variables, and this will become very important when we get into graphical user interfaces. List comprehensions. This is something that's a little bit quirky, a little bit more difficult to grasp. It comes from languages like Lisp. 
You can read more about it at that link there. But essentially, you can create lists more concisely by putting everything you need in a statement as opposed to having a whole bunch of statements with a for loop and everything else. So both of these things in the Lime background are perfectly acceptable, but the reality is they both do the same thing. They both make a list called squares, and each member is equal to x squared, and x is running from 0 to 9, or 10 items, so you'll have a result of 0, 1, 4, 9, 16. The difference is that in the shorter version you created by simply using the square brackets or the list detonator, the thing that, that, that denotes um, lists, and then put in an expression in it, followed by one for clause, so like 4x in range 10, and then optional and additional if and for clauses. So I'm going to give you an advanced example. <clears throat> Suppose you wanted to make that list for x in 1, 2, 3, for y in 3, 1, 4. If x doesn't equal y, then append the combination. What we're doing there is we're doing every combination of the numbers 1, 2, 3 and the numbers 3, 1, 4 where the numbers are different. This is a very common thing, combinations and permutations, when you're doing cryptography. Well, you can replace all of those statements with this line that you see in the second line colored box. And I won't read it out for you because it's, you know, sounds weird, but if you just look at it, and just spend a second looking at it, you can see that it has the exact same information really as the extended statements just on top of it. So let's suppose that you had a list of movies and this list was called movies and you want to find all of the movies that has the word matrix in the title. Well you could um, hello use what you see there movies equals and here's my list and then I could just say X for X in movies if matrix in X and sure enough if we did that it would work so let's do a list comprehension that has sub lists that's even that sounds even more uh, fancy so let's suppose you have a list of dictionaries. The list is called movies, but each dictionary doesn't just have the title. It also has the release date and the rating from Rotten Tomatoes or whatever. And again, you want the movies that have the word matrix in the title. Well, each element now is a dictionary, so you need to access what's inside the dictionary. So in our example, it would be X with the brackets and then title, because that's what the key is called. So we would want X title for X in movies if matrix is in X title. When to use list comprehension? Is it faster? <coughs> no, not particularly. It could be with very, very complex or very long lists, but that's not really why we do it. Is it easier to read? It could be easier to read. Is it always easier to read? No, not necessarily. Can it be used for the dictionary class? Yes, it can. So I invite you to look at the references because it's quite complicated. Um, I just gave you two simple examples there. And just let me tell you that it is something that you will use and you will want to use. So when to just say no? Well, let's suppose that you're an FBI analyst and you're looking for a suspect. And this suspect 
has a white pickup truck that has six tires. They gave you a partial plate number. The only thing you know is that it says DAV. The owner has brown eyes. <clears throat> His name may be Dominic or Dominic with a K or maybe Domingo. He's at least 5'9". He last used this credit card in Utah. Could you do it with, with Python? Yep, you could. You could do it with Python. Could you do this using list comprehension? Well, you could, theoretically. But since each of those lists, like for example, credit card usage in the state of Utah, or every registered license plate um, could be literally terabytes, you would need terabytes of RAM in your FBI computer. So that would be, that would be a difficult thing. Now, after you wrote up this entire list comprehension, what if the next time they called you, they said, oh, whoops, that wasn't his first name, that was his last name, and he doesn't drive a pickup truck, he drives a convertible. Well, now you have to rewrite your entire um, list comprehension, and that's just awkward. So this is where interfacing with SQL is really the appropriate answer, and we will cover that at a at a uh, later time. So let's look at a more realistic example. Suppose you have a list of model rockets and motor combinations and, a, and it's called flights. Now there are 10,000 possible flights there. Um, each of those flights is an object. In other words, it's not just a string. It has the, the name, it has materials, it has compositions, it has all kinds of things. Now you have several motors in your bag, and there's three examples there. The FAA this morning only cleared you for 5,000 foot ceiling. You only have a half mile of desert to recover the rocket when it's going to fall down, and your wind is blowing at three miles per hour. Well, you need to find which rocket motor combination is going to work for you. Because you have your three motors, you have a bunch of rockets there with the kids that you tutor. So let's say that the motor is M, the max altitude is H. For every two mile per hour wind that's out there, you're going to need a field to recover your parachute, you know, fall your, your rocket that's falling with a parachute, and that recovery distance is R. Let's say the wind speed is S, well, write code that will find the correct flight for you, and then let's write a list comprehension for the same thing. Now you can pause it and give yourself a couple of minutes, or you can just look at the answer. Here it comes. So the rocket problem, the code that you see there would work. H equals 5,000, that was our sailing, S equals three, that's our wind speed, and so on and so forth. And then we would have two nested loops for a flight and flights, and then for each motor and motors. Now you're going to check that the flight is adequate for your particular parameters. Now, that works, it works perfect. Well, the list comprehension that you see just underneath that example will also work. Um, so is it more legible? Well, that's up to you. But nested loops aren't really that typical. Now let's look at the walrus operator. There are three operators that use the equal signs. The regular equals, the double equals, and what they call the walrus operators and they're different and they are on purpose they are written differently so that you don't mistake one for the other there are several languages where these operations use the same equal sign and it makes things quite confusing in python you use three different expressions so the double equal sign that's used to compare items. For example, hey, does A equals B? Okay? When you're using floating point arithmetic, as we talked about a long time ago, way back in slide 43, the 
whether or not something is equal is sort of a matter of opinion. Like I said before, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, if you add that three times, it is not equal to 0 0.3 because of problems with the binary representation of decimal numbers. So we have these methods is close and the complex mathematics version of it that we use instead of the double equals to compare um, floating point numbers. The equals all by itself <coughs> places a result in a variable. So x equals 5 puts the value 5 in a memory location referenced by x. However, it does not make a copy of objects. So if a is an object, b equals a does not make a new copy of a and places it in b. To make a copy, you actually have to use the command copy. And you can link on there and get more information and understand the difference. Then you have the walrus operator. You can see that it looks like a walrus because it has the little eyeballs and the, and the tusk. And this is an assignment expression. When in heck would you use that? Well, oftentimes you're going to use a temporary variable somewhere so that you can avoid calling a function or a method more than once, especially in a loop. So this happens quite often when you're looking at the length of a list. So something that's typical is if n, I'm sorry, n equals the length of a, if n equals zero, then blah, blah, blah. You put the length of a in a temporary variable n so that you don't have to use it in the if and then once again in the string as we see there format n because we want to tell the user what that the list was too short well the walrus operator can avoid that first line of code it basically just creates the variable n inside of the if statement and in order to basically tell python that you mean to do this on purpose you have to use the walrus operator, okay? Again, you can see there's not much difference there, and the reality is that you don't use it all that much, but it is very useful in list comprehensions that we just talked about. And then the last two things I wanna talk about in this little section are the commands break and continue. Now, we talked about break a little bit before. Continue is similar, but not the same. So break, that's a command that'll stop instantly the for or the while loop, okay? So you get so far along, you hit some condition, you don't want to continue anymore, you issue a break and boom, you drop right out of the loop. Continue is similar, <coughs> but it doesn't stop the entire loop. It simply stops the execution of the block, wherever you are, and then starts again at the next point in the sequence. So you see this example here that uses both the continue and the break statements. If I run this, we would get the numbers four, five, six, seven, and eight. Because every time that i is less than four, it does the continue statement, so it ignores everything um, in the rest of the loops block, but it does do the next item in the sequence. Once we hit i greater than 8, we hit that break command, and sure enough, boom, we drop out and we just don't do anything greater or anything else in the loop. <coughs> so, the print would only show four, five, six, seven, and eight. Look at that closely. Again, these are shortcuts. They're not strictly necessary, but you will see them, especially when looking at other people's code. And I uh, hope you enjoyed that. That was the end of part 20, and I'll see you again in part 21.